Hello everyone. Today is Good Friday, the 29th of March 2024. Uh, I've just got home from the service. Um, I went to the Oxford Oratory in Oxford, England. And uh, if you're interested in seeing the service, I will put a link because they stream it. And uh, I hope it will be ready. <laughs> um, as you know, um, I'm Catholic, but um, we have no, there is no Mass today. It's the service, the readings from the Old and the New Testament, and then the Adoration of the Cross. And in the readings of the, certainly of the, the Old Testament, the reading of the Passion of Christ, I reflected when Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate by Caiaphas, the high priest, he denounced him to the Roman authorities. Pontius Pilate was saying to him, well, he is Jewish, he's a Jew, you uh, take care of him according to your law. You know that in the Roman Empire, uh, as the empire expanded, peoples and tribes and towns and cities were allowed to keep their own gods. They were tolerated, and they would bring then their gods to the, um, you know, to be there with all the other gods. They had no problem with that. But of course there were some going to show you in the reading after after these few words. Nevertheless, you have to acknowledge the Roman emperor as a god and all other kind of things. So they were allowed a certain amount of tolerance as to their gods and their traditions and customs, as long as they did not go flatly against the Romans. And so Pontius Pilate said, well, uh, he's Jewish, he's, Jew, he's a Jew, so you charge him according to your law. And the high priest said, no, because uh, it was the Passover, they couldn't do it, we bring it to you. And in jest, Pontius Pilate said, but he is said to be the king of the Jews. And Caiaphas, <coughs> the Jewish high priest, did not say, we have no other king or other god, but the God Almighty. He said, we only have one king, and that is Caesar. He gave them a choice between Jesus and a uh, robber, Barnabas, and the people wanted Jesus to be the one crucified. And the cries of crucify him, crucify him, by the multitudes, crucify him. And I was, uh, as I was hearing that, I thought of the citizens of the state of Israel, who now against the Gazans, the Gazans, the Palestinians are saying, we see them on videos, not a drop of water, not one single drop of water for those people who are animals. There isn't much difference. And since, as a Catholic, as a traditional Catholic, I know that Jesus came not just for the Jews, not just for the Gentiles, but the whole of mankind. I think we, if we are going to find Jesus anywhere today, he's dying there with the people of Gaza, being starved to death. If he is anywhere today, he's certainly in Gaza.
I don't mean to offend any one of the Muslim, Muslim religion. I know it's a different religion. But I think Jesus is in Gaza today. Okay, so I'm going to uh, read you a little bit. I know sometimes I'm a little bit of a bore <laughs> with my readings, but I cannot say it as well myself. So I just read. <laughs> um, this is a very old book. The Legacy of the Ancient World by William G. de Burg, written last century, uh, the 19th century actually. And uh, it goes through the different, uh, you know, uh, different religions, different civilizations, I should say has a long chapter on the Jews and Judaism, also, of course, of uh, Greece and Rome. And eventually, halfway through the book, he gets to Christianity and how it arose. In other words, what was happening in the Roman world at that time. I think you'll find it interesting, if I can read it properly. Chapter 9, Christianity, the expansion of Christianity over the Roman world. A generation had not passed since the establishment of the Roman Empire by Augustus when the founder of Christianity was born into the world, Imperante Augusto Natus Est. The significance of this fact in world history cannot be measured solely by the influence wielded by the Christian Church on the religious and social life of Christendom. The Church, like all other institutions, was but the outward embodiment of the living faith from which it drew its energy. The foundation of that faith was the personality of Jesus. The spirit of his life passed into the lives of his immediate followers and threw them into the world around, transforming men's hearts and minds with a suddenness and swiftness without parallel in history. A new power was at work, which revolutionized the entire fabric of Mediterranean civilization. At the moment when Jesus died on the cross by sentence of a Roman procurator, his mission had to all appearance ended in failure. Only a handful of unlettered rustics, mostly women, remained faithful to the last. Three centuries later, Constantine, in establishing Christianity as the uniform religion of the empire, was simply acknowledging an accomplished fact. It was not merely that the old cults were supplanted by a new, but rather that the entire substructure of the Greco-Roman society from which those cults had sprung was undermined and that in its place there was arising a new order, permeated by the spirit of Christianity, which was reflected not only in the field of religious faith and worship, but in morals and law, in art and literature, in the treatment of slaves and women, in men's whole outlook upon life. When we ask, as the student of history needs must ask, for the grounds of this transformation, they are to be found in the unique quality of the faith that Jesus inspired in his disciples. The question is not one of the speculative value, value of Christian dogma. Christianity was not a new philosophy, but a new religion. 
Jesus bade men believe not in an idea, but in a person who had lived and died as a man amongst them, among amongst men. He claimed that in this person, the Son of God from love of man had taken human form and been born on earth at a definite moment of history to found the kingdom of heaven and bring salvation to mankind. Idea and actuality, fact and value, were indissolubly in conjoined in the person of Jesus. It was only after Christianity had won its empire over the Greco-Roman world that its speculative implications were disengaged from this core of concrete religious faith and formulated under the influence of Hellenic thought in a system of theological doctrine. It was the overpowering impression of Christ's personality and sacrifice that gave life to the instruments of church and dogma and won for the Christian gospel the allegiance of the Mediterranean world. Christianity arose and spread in relation to a historical context. In its origin, it was rooted in the soil of Judaism. Its advance was conditioned by the culture of the Greco-Roman world. Born a Jew, observant in all points of Jewish ceremonial, circumcised on the eighth day in accordance with Mosaic pres prescript, Jesus declared that he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. His first mission was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His teaching is reminiscent at every turn of the Jewish scriptures and of the religious tradition and practice of the Jewish race. Preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth, he took for his theme a passage from the servant songs of the second Isaiah. The kingdom which he proclaimed to be at hand was the natural fulfillment of the vision of the prophets. When those who, like the Pharisees, looked for the coming of the kingdom and the resurrection from the dead, failed to recognize in him the promised deliverer, it was not he that rejected Judaism, but Judaism that rejected him. Footnote, the Pharisees, which means separated, combined devotion to the law with his interpretation in the light of later tradition, which was often of a liberalizing uh, tendency. They were strongly nationalist and had a large popular following. They looked for a restored kingdom under a secular prince of Davidic line and opposed the priestly ideal of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were aristocratic and sacerdotal priestly and very conservative in their adherence to the law as opposed to later tra tradition. For example, they denied the resurrection, uh, the Acts, uh, Acts 23, 6 to 8, Matthew 22, 22, 20, uh, 22, 33. Christianity made many converts among the Pharisees. The Sadducees were bitterly hostile. Acts 5, 17. The future of Judaism rested with the Pharisees, whose view of the law as supplemented by tradition lay at the root of the rabbinical teaching in the early centuries of our era. In their very refuse, refusal, they were treading in the steps of their forefathers who had killed the prophets and stoned those who had been sent unto them. For Christ's doctrine of the kingdom, founded on the larger hope of Hebrew prophecy, stood in sharp contrast to the patriotic aspirations of his contemporaries.
While they expected a Messiah who should achieve a secular liberation from the hated yoke of Rome, and establish in Zion a nationalist theocracy over the princes and peoples of the earth, he broke forever with these particularist ambitions, and resisting the temptations to institute an earthly sovereignty, declared that his kingdom was not of this world. Herein lay the incompatibility between the old faith and the new. Henceforward their severance could only be a question of time. The rapid spread of Christianity in Jerusalem in the years following Christ's death provoked the bitter hostility of the Jewish ecclesiastical authorities to whom the Roman government allowed a wide measure of autonomy. The propagation of the gospel among the Gentiles brought the issue to a crisis. Already before the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, St. Paul, it had won adherents among the non-Jewish population in Syria and in Cyprus. Were these Gentile uh, converts to be subjected to the right of uh, circumcision and the manifold rigors of the Mosaic law? Was it not possible to be a Christian without also being a Jew? It was on the morrow of his first missionary journey that St. Paul, despite a strong opposition with, without the Christian community and his own strong Jewish attachments, carried the day with his policy of emancipation. Um, he proclaimed the watchword of his mission in his letter to the Galatian churches. Quote, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, faith, through, faith working through love. Faith working through love. Conduct. The die was cast. From this time onwards, Christianity, though still confounded with Judaism by the outside world, developed as a free and independent faith. The dispersion of the Jews after the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus, the Emperor Titus, in the year 70, and the still more terrible subjugation under Hadrian, 136, struck a fatal blow both at Jewish nationalism and at the Juda Judaism party within the church. Jerusalem ceased to be regarded as the religious center of Christianity, and the Judaizing Christians who survived for many generations under the name of Ebionites or Nazareans in the region east of the Jordan had no influence on its subsequent history. By the reign of Trajan, the distinction of Jew from Christian was recognized throughout the Roman world. Another footnote here. The Ebionites, which means the poor, were separated from the church by the end of the second century, but survived especially in Egypt and Arabia until the fourth century. The Jews found it to their interest to make the distinction clear to the Roman author authorities, for while Judaism was officially tolerated, Christianity was not. In the second century, the Jews ceased to proselytize actively, to try to convert people, yes? And Judaism has remained a separate religion ever since. As Judaism recoiled from the West, so Christianity has never struck root on Semitic soil. In that larger world, and not within the narrow pale of Judaism, lay the future of the new religion.
But long before the process of emancipation was complete, Christianity had been impregnated with the spirit and to a certain extent the letter of the parent faith. From Israel it inherited the belief in one God, the creator and ruler of the universe, the father of mankind, who as a spiritual person demanded from his children the personal service of a righteous life. It inherited also the Old Testament scriptures, which were accepted as a divine revelation, while they were divested of their particularist implications and interpreted in the light of the conviction of Jewish Jesus the Messiahship of Jesus Messiahship Jesus being the Messiah the Messiah. Therewith was received into Christian practice a code of moral precepts, unique in purity and applicable to the homeliest concerns of daily life. Moreover, the worship of the early church was largely modeled on the simple service of the Jewish synagogue with its prayers, its hymns, its reading and exposition of the scriptures. Christian spiritual experience found expression in prophetic vision, like that of the seers and the prophets of ancient Israel. The vivid expectation of Christ's second coming, the parousia, and the whole circle of beliefs and hopes associated therewith, in the resurrection, the divine judgment, and the age to come, took shape in imagery and language that present a close analogy to Jewish apocalyptic literature. The conceptions of Satan, of angels and evil demons, of an earthly, earthly millennium, of the condemnation of the wicked to physical torment were but a few of these Jewish survivals which left an abiding impress on Christian eschatology. Finally, the record of God's dealings with the Jewish people was regarded from the first as a preparation for the Gospel, the New Testament. A preparation for the New Testament. Yahweh was the one true God who spake by the prophets to the Christian as aforetime to the Jew. The ever-widening gulf between the society of Christ's followers and Orthodox Judaism served but to enhance this consciousness of the spiritual obligation that the Christian faith owed to the religion of Israel. The Roman Empire furnished the field for the expansion of the Christian faith. Of progress beyond its borders, little is known, and that little is of slight moment. St. Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles and himself a Roman citizen, headed straight for the Hellenic provinces, founding churches in the chief centers of trade and culture, such as Ephesus, Thessalonica, Philippi, Corinth, Corinth and Athens. His first appeal was to his co-religionists in the synagogues. Among his auditors were many who, though not professing Jews, were conversant with the Jewish faith and well disposed towards it. The hostility of the Orthodox and the ready addition of these Gentiles led swiftly to the preaching of the Gospel beyond the Jewish pale. Carried a prisoner to Rome in the year 61, St. Paul found a Christian community already in being. Three years before he had written to them a letter commending their faith as known throughout the world. On his acquittal by the imperial tribunal two years later, he resumed his missionary labors, returning to Rome to perish with St. Peter in the persecution under Nero 
in the year 64. You remember that Nero um, blamed the Christians for the fires of Rome. In less than 20 years since St. Paul first set sail from Antioch, Christianity had taken firm root throughout the empire, alike in East and West, in congregations organized under chosen elders or presbyters or bishops. There is a foot, rather lengthy footnote here. In the apostolic age, the general supervision of the churches was in the hands of the apostles who traveled from church to church exercising the higher functions, for example ordination and confirmation, which afterwards devolved on the, the, the bishops. The local ministry had but a limited and subordinate scope. The two features of local self-government of each church and general supervision of all the churches were thus present in germ from the outset. The former received definite shape earlier than the latter. Government of each church by a single bishop, presbyters and deacons was the rule at Antioch in the time of Ignatius the early 2nd century, and was general throughout Christendom in the 3rd century. At first, the terms presbyter and overseer, or bishop, were identical in usage. Gradually, the bishop's office was separated from that of the presbyters. In the early 3rd century, the bishop was still elected by the laity, with whom he stood in close personal relations as the shepherd of his particular flock. But in the chief towns, they grew up, uh, in the chief towns, the there grew up during the, that grew up during that century a large body of presbyters and deacons between the bishop and the laity. The presbyters became the spiritual, the deacons, the administrative intermediaries of the bishop. In the 4th and 5th centuries, the gulf between the bishop and the laity widened. The clergy, with many new grades of offices, were alone in close touch with the bishop, and the election of the bishop passed from the people into their hands. In place of popular election followed by approval by the uh, clergy, clerical election was followed by popular confirmation. The same two centuries saw also a the vindication by the presbyters of the right to celebrate the Eucharist and to preach, i.e. the rise of the sacerdotal conception of the priesthood, and b. the parochial system, with a presbyter in charge of each parochial church. All these changes came about slowly and naturally. They were not the result of any deliberate policy, though maintained by deliberate policy when, one, when once established. Um, the institution of a priesthood entered voluntarily, open to all, and independent of civic and political institutions was peculiar to Christianity. The first two features distinguish it from Judaism, the last from Greco-Roman cults. All right. Of its history in the half-century between Nero and Trajan, there is scanty record. But the results show that the period was one of unbroken and vigorous, vigorous activity. The two chief centers of Christian life were the churches of Rome and Antioch, which worked in close cooperation.
The story of the persecutions in the second century reveals the presence of Christian communities not only in Italy, Greece and Asia, but in Africa and Gaul and, uh, and Britain and in the wilds of Dalmatia. The converts, though drawn in the main from the proletariat, included men and women of wealth and station. Christians had risen to high rank in the army and the civil service. Some were appointed even to provincial governorships. We are of yesterday, wrote Tertullian at the, as the century drew to its close, but we have filled your whole world, cities, islands, country towns and settlements, even the camps, the tribes, the decuries of judges, the palace, the senate, the bar. We have let you only your temples. We can count your armies. The Christians of a single province exceed them in number. Christianity had become a force to be reckoned with in society and in the world. Philosophers and men of letters took note of its existence. The government was alarmed at the rapid spread of an unlicensed confraternity and issue stern decrees for its suppression. The Christians felt the, necess the necessity of championing their faith in the face of popular calumny and official persecution, and the abler minds among them composed apologetic writings in its defence. Meanwhile, disruptive tendencies were at work within the Church. The prophets and prophetesses of Montanism, voicing the revolt of personal inspiration against ecclesiastical discipline, spread the menace of anarchy from Phrygia to Africa and the West. While in the eastern provinces, while in the eastern provinces, Gnostic teachers threatened to dissolve the faith in a historical Christ into a phantasmagoria of speculative abstraction. On the one hand lay the danger of antinomianism, on the other that of absorption into Hellenic metaphysics. The nucleus of dogmatic theology, of which we shall speak presently, is discernible in, the, in these second century controversies. They called into play the intellectual weapons that had been forged by the genius of Greek philosophers. Side by side with the intellectual legacy of Hellenism, Christianity began also to absorb the political legacy of Rome. Need was felt for a regulating authority alike in faith and practice. Though each church as yet preserved its local, local independence, there prevailed throughout Christendom a strong consciousness of unity, which was bound to issue in the establishment of a central regulative organ. The world had long been habituated to look to Rome as to the founding of law and justice. Her secular vocation and authority had been recognized by St. Paul, who taught with no uncertain voice the duty of obedience to the civil government. To render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's was an accepted part of the Christian rule of life. It was inevitable that the imperial system should set its mark deep on the structure of the Christian community. As in the secular economy of the empire all roads led to Rome, so the Roman Church and its bishop formed the natural center of ecclesiastical intercommunication for the other churches of Christendom. Not that there was yet any question of the formal recognition of the primacy of the Roman see. The Roman bishops claimed no right to override the autonomy of local churches. Such authority as they possess was de facto rather than de jure.
but Rome felt from early days an instinctive consciousness of ecumenical responsibility. The first epistle of Clement, written at the close of the first century, expresses the active interest of the Roman Church in the spiritual welfare of other Christian communities. This, in turn, viewed the Roman Church with natural veneration. Her illustrious apostolic tradition gathered round the martyrdoms of St. Peter and St. Paul, the number of influence of her members, the bounty which their wealth enabled them to dispense to less favoured congregations, and above all, her unquestioned orthodox orthodoxy and sobriety of judgment, these com combined with her central position and the prestige of the imperial metropolis to strengthen her growing authority as the leader of Christendom. Irenaeus, a Gallic bishop of Asiatic birth and the foremost champion of orthodoxy in the closing years of the second century, spoke of her superior sovereignty as the exponent of apostolic faith. In all the most important developments in the life of the Church, such as the organization of the Episcopal hierarchy, the fixing of the New Testament canon, the formulation of the baptismal confession as the apostolic rule which served as the nucleus of a creed, and the regulation of internal discipline, Rome played a leading part. Especially in the handling of such delicate questions as moral offences among Christians, the treatment of apostates in times of persecution, and the growth of ascetic practices, her sound judgment and instinct for ecclesiastical statesmanship were of incalculable service to Christianity. Nor was the Roman Church merely a disciplinary and legislative power. Her constancy am amid persecution gave evidence that her seal for orthodoxy and order was inspired by a grasp of the spiritual essentials of the faith. In matters of doctrine, Rome stood consistently for the apostolic tradition. She held to Christianity as a religion, resisting firmly all tendencies to reduce it to a speculative theory of the schools. To Rome it was chiefly due that the impulse towards the unity of Christendom crystallized into definite shape as the conception of a single visible church, Catholic, that is universal, and apostolic following the teaching of the Apostles, the earthly embodiment of the invisible kingdom of God and the necessary instrument of man's salvation. Thus, many of the salient phenomena in the Church's history, the multitude of its adherents, its growth in wealth and secular influence, its organization through episcopal synods, the severance of clergy from laity and the rise of sacerdotalism, the multiplication of heresies, the concentration of interest on doctrinal problems and the progressive assimilation of the heritage of the Greco-Roman philosophy and law appear as the progressive unfolding of germs that were already alive in the early Christianity of the second century. There is no break in continuity from the apostolic age to that of Constantine. The general policy of the empire towards the religions of its subjects was one of mingled uh, toleration and uniformity. Throughout antiquity, religions were national, the citizen being under obligation to the gods of his community. As the P 
peoples of the Mediterranean world were absorbed politically into the Roman state. Their local cults continued to be recognized side by side with that of Rome. No inconsistency was felt when a Roman pontiff worshipped Sibylle or Mithra, or when an Egyptian devo devotee of Isis offered incense at the altar of Augustus. Only in rare cases and on grounds of morality rather than of religion were particular rites prohibited by the Roman government such as those of the Druids in Gaul, with their accompany, accompaniment of human sacrifice, or the casting of children into the flames before Moloch among the Semites of Africa. On the other hand, all alike were expected to pay honour to the genius of Rome and of Augustus, the religious symbol of the political unity of the empire. This tribute involved no renunciation of other divinities and no profession of religious faith. It was but a formal act of allegiance to Caesar on the part of Caesar's subjects. That anyone should boggle at it, at it on religious grounds was incomprehensible to the Roman mind. In fact, associated as it was by skillful policy with the autonomy of the provincial councils, it was accepted everywhere, not merely without a murmur, but even with ardour, save by the Jews and the Christians. Their refusal to bow in homage to any god save one, perfectly intelligible to us today, excited in the Roman only irritation and contempt. In the case of the Jews, whose faith was national, the authorities were prepared to compromise, sanctioning their worship as a religio licita, licit. Though they forbade under heavy penalties the conversion of Roman citizens to Judaism. A footnote Hadrian prohibited circumcision and instituted, instituted Greco Roman worship at Jerusalem, despite the terrible vengeance enacted for the revolt that ensued, the Jews retained their rights and worship. Early in the 3rd century, Severus penalized conversion to Judaism, but by this time the Jews had ceased to proselytize. Okay, so the Jews themselves uh, stop uh, trying to convert others to Judaism. So long as Christianity was undistinguished from Judaism, it shared in his official in, in its in this official toleration. Gallio in the Acts viewed the outcry of the Jews against Saint Paul as a just a petty internal squabble, and with the indifference of a model civ, uh, of a modern civil servant confronted with a sectarian dispute among the natives of India, cared for none of these things. It was not his business to wrangle over technicalities of the Mosaic Code, but to repress crime and keep the peace. The persecution at Rome in the first century under Nero in the year 64 and Domitian in the year 96 were not due to an official policy of suppression but arose out of local and temporary circumstances in connection with allegations of specific crime. The historian Tacitus thus describes Nero's attempt to divert from himself the odium caused by the, by the Great Fire of 64 and quote from Tacitus the historian, consequently, to get rid of the report 
that Nero had ordered the fire. Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate's. Pilates, uh, says Pilatus, okay, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was made, was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of fire in the city as of hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to the, their deaths. The Christians continue, uh, the historian Tacitus, the Christians covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt, to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for this spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloof on a car. Hence, even for criminals who, dis uh, who deserve extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion. For it was not, as it seemed, for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. That is the quote from Tacitus. It was in the reign of Trajan <coughs> that Christianity was first proclaimed an Ill illicit religion, the existence of which contravened the law of the empire. When in the year 112, Pliny, as governor of Bithynia, reported to the emperor for instructions, the answer was in strict conformity with imperial tradition. There was no desire to persecute, and Trajan showed evidence, evident reluctance to take proceedings, but the law must be obeyed. Every inducement was offered for recantation, and above all, charges must rest on definite and responsible information. The rescript approving Pliny's action was brief and incisive. Quote, you have adopted my secundus, quite the right course in examining the cases of those who were denounced to you as Christians. For indeed, no general rule can be laid down which might afford what may be called a fixed form of procedure. They must not be sought out. If they are denounced and convicted, they must be punished, yet with this limitation that anyone who denies that he is a Christian and proves his denial by deed, that is to say by adoring our gods, however suspicious his first conduct may have been, shall earn pardon by repentance. But Anonymous placards are not to be regarded in the case of any crime, for that would be a very bad example and worthy of our time. The hostility of the crowd, such as St. Paul had faced in earlier days at Ephesus, vented itself frequently in charges of immorality to which a confraternity that holds secret meetings is always liable.
the Roman administration was studiously careful not to take action on such irresponsible evidence. Christians, if proved to be such, were condemned as Christians for the name. But Trajan's successors were not invariably so indifferent to the public clamor. The martyrdom of Polycarp at Smyrna under Antoninus Pius in the year 155 and the Leon persecution under Marcus Aurelius in the year 177 were fomented by the mob. In the course of the second century, the churches of Asia, Greece, Gaul and Africa all suffered under the strong arm of the Roman state. Its policy alternated between active repression and tacit tolerance. The most conscientious emperors were the most rigorous to enforce the law. Commodus indeed might be whittled into indulgence by the entreaties of his Christian mistress, and Hadrian's sceptical indifference might incline him to discount the political danger of an illicit confraternity. But the very loyalty of Marcus Aurelius to his stoic creed served but to blind him to the faith which led the slave girl Blandina to face with joy the beasts in the Lyon arena, or the aged Bothinus to answer the legate's question, who is the god of the Christians? With the proud words, if thou art worthy, thou shalt know. Sheer obstinacy, such was the stoic emperor Marcus Aurelius' reflection in his meditations. And for all his Hellenic wisdom, he bade the terrors of the arena to be added to those of death. The persecutions of the second century brought thousands of adherents to the gospel. The blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. The spectacle of their constancy stirred even the bureaucrats and the legionnaires to pity. Epictetus showed a truer insight. Epictetus was a slave. Epictetus showed a truer insight, uh, insight than Marcus Aurelius when he observed how the Galileans were disciplined to despise tyrants and that the demonstrations of the schools were impotent to generate such a faith. Doubtless, the Christians were often provocative in speech and action and courted death by their contumely towards he heathen worships. Such displays were hardly calculated to move their enemies to admiration. It was their devotion to their master that was compelling and conclusive. When Polycarp was bidden to curse Christ, he answered, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me wrong. How then can I curse the king, my saviour? Their love, their loved one towards, uh, one towards another and their simple purity of life refuted more effectively than all the literary efforts of the apologists the current allegations of devoutry and treason. But it was inevitable that as the faith grew in influence and favour, the resolve of the government to enforce the law should become more pronounced. Its attitude was that of the practical man in all ages. Appealing to common sense and reasons of state, it pursued a vacillating policy of kicks and kindness and called it justice. The more capable among the third century emperors saw instinctively that Christianity was a dissolvent agent, agency, 
alien in spirit to the culture of which the empire was the guardian. The political unity of the state required expression in a uniform worship, and the hour had not yet come when that function could be fulfilled by the new religion. Above all, the eyes of the rulers were fixed on the need of defending the frontiers against the tide of Teutonic barbarism, and the spread of Christianity in the army seemed a menace to military discipline. For this reason, they favoured Mithra Mithraism, a soldier's creed, and in no wise irreconcilable with the official worship of Augustus. Hence we find that two deliberate attempts were made, one by Decius in the middle years of the 3rd century, one by Diocletian and his colleague uh, Galerius at the opening of the 4th, to exterminate the Christian faith. The last mention was the most terrible that the Church was ever called upon to endure. For two years it raged with full blast throughout the empire. It formed the crowning struggle between paganism and Christianity. In the West, the rigor of the persecution abated on Diocletian's abdication in the year 305, but in the East, the ancient nursery of Christianity, it continued with increasing ferocity till the eve of Galerius' death in the year 311. Its failure carried with it the final triumph of the new religion. The event came swiftly. In 312, Constantine, master of the West by the victory at the Milvian Bridge, entered Rome under the Christian banner. In the following year, conjointly with his Eastern colleague Licinius, he proclaimed liberty of conscience and restored to the Church its confiscated buildings and lands. In the year 324, the overthrow of Licinius in the East laid the Roman world at the feet of Constantine. And the year after, the Christian bishops who had gathered at his summons passed into the council chamber at Nicaea amid the salutes of the imperial soldiery. Christianity was officially established as the religion of the Roman Empire. Another footnote. Constantine's motives in recognizing Christianity as the religion of the empire were doubtless in part political, but his family were pro-Christian and there is no reason to question the sincerity of his preference. The emperors of this age, whether pro-Christian or anti-Christian, and despite moral shortcomings, were often sincerely devout. This is equally true of Diocletian, Galerius and Constantine. It was an age of soldier princes, and soldiers are not wont to be free thinkers. Rationalist scepticism was out of keeping with the times. Constantine was not baptized till just before his death in the year 337, but there was nothing unusual in this. In considering his recognition of Christianity, we must banish entirely the modern ideas associated with an established church. Decius and Diocletian tried to exterminate, exterminate Christianity because, not being a state religion, it had no right to exist. Constantine solved the difficulty by declaring it to be a state religion. His action was doubtless advantageous to the imperial government, but it was a disaster of the first magnitude for Christianity. For a... Secular, secularism invaded its domain, and B, in Duchesne's words, uh, he's a, f a French um, scholar, um, the church um, 
we would soon become moribund. <clears throat> Excuse me. The painful results which Dante attributed to the unhistorical donation of Constantine had the real source in the establishment of Christianity as the state religion. All right. The efforts of the Roman government to crush Christianity claim notice for two reasons. In the first place, the nature and methods of his religious policy reflect the deep cleavage that parted the old order of society from the new. It is quite true that the persecutions, save those of Decius and of Diocletian, were neither persistent nor universal and that in the intervals the church enjoyed comparative tranquillity and was recognized in practice, though not in theory, as a property-holding and autonomous corporation. But in principle the empire could only be hostile, seeing that its roots were planted in the soil of a Hellenism to which the Christian gospel appeared as foolishness. Secondly, the story of the persecution, the persecutions in the plural, throws into relief the spirit that was the driving power of early Christianity. The annals of ecclesiastical institutions and doctrinal controversies are apt to blind our eyes to the presence of this essential force. Christianity, as a faith working in the world for its redemption, had of necessity to objectify itself in a visible framework of institutions, documents and creeds. These outward embodiments must needs appear inadequate when measured by the living experience which they struggle to express. The hierarchical church of Irenaeus and Cyprian, with its liturgy and canons, its authorized title deeds and rules of faith, its property and buildings, its severance of clergy from laity, its growing secularization, and above all, its claims that membership of a visible society is a prerequisite of salvation, might easily be thought a derogation when compared with the life of the primitive confraternity of the apostolic age. The atmosphere seems more clouded than, uh, that in, than that in which moved the first disciples, united in brotherly love as members of an invisible kingdom and awaiting in hourly expectation the second coming of the Lord. The record of the martyrs serves to remind us of our error. Behind the visible institution, the living faith endured, but side by side with its message of hope and salvation to the individual, it had taken shape as an organized community, bearing witness to the conviction that Christ, though ascended into heaven, was still present among his followers on earth. There was no inherent contradiction between the faith and its visible embodiment. Christianity was never merely an institutional religion. Neither was it the religion of a book. Even the New Testament scriptures were a means to an end, nor finally was it the religion of a creed. Dogmas like documents and institutions were but instruments of its mission. The Greek word for creed is symbolon or a symbol. Not these alone, but the faith that gave them life enabled Christianity to emerge, emerge victorious from its warfare with the Roman state and with Hellenic culture. It was the love of Christ informing the lives of his followers that overcame the world. And so I finish this reading with 
the following thought. I don't know whether I expressed this at the beginning, but in case I didn't. We are seeing today ultimate on Good Friday, ultimate love versus deepest hatred. Ultimate sacrifice against the deepest revenge. And so the war goes on. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.